Hey gardeners, Amy here with Garden Up Landscape and I have a guest with me today. This is Diane Stutzman with Desert Jewels Nursery and she has a special presentation to show us. Uh, Diane, do you wanna tell us a little bit about your nursery and what you do and then go ahead and jump into your presentation. Well, uh, my nursery is focused on drought adapted plants in particular, uh, North American natives as much as possible, but I also um, I also produce some non natives, but the the focus is drought adapted and native. Yes, I love visiting your nursery. You have the coolest stuff you can't find anywhere else, um, folks. If you're in Spokane, she's located out on East Up River Drive. Uh, are you still requiring appointments? Yes, I'm still working by appointment because it's usually just me, so it's easier to manage my time if I uh, do it by appointment. And it's easier to give the customer my full attention if there aren't a number of people there. Yeah, what a brilliant way to manage the business. Uh, COVID did some interesting stuff to the way we run businesses, that's for sure. It did indeed. Uh, some of it's not all bad, it's great. So Diane, you've been in botany for a number of years. The, the nursery is not your first um, experience. Tell us about your credentials and your history with natives and with everything else that you've done. Well, I started as a gardener when I was in my 20s and uh, ended up working for the Forest Service and um, in silviculture and then switched over, got my credentials to be a professional botanist and switched over to doing rare plant work with the Forest Service in, in Northern Idaho. Um, I've worked as a botanist in Idaho, South Dakota, Oregon, and Washington. Most recently, uh, nine years on the Spokane District of the Bureau of Land Management, where I got to know and love the sagebrush step. Mm. Um, I also had an absolutely wonderful uh, journeyman botany position after after the Forest Service in Idaho, in South Dakota in the Black Hills. I I had the great good fortune of uh, doing an inventory of high quality plant communities for the Black Hills eco region the most fun job I've ever had. And that made me fall in love with the prairie. Oh, that's so cool. An inventory of all the plants that were on that area. Like just, ah. Yeah. Oh. The plant communities, what, what plants like to grow together in what habitats? So it's like natural companion planting. Yes, yes. It's oh, so cool. I love it, I love it. Um, okay, so, why we're doing this. Um, Water-wise landscaping is becoming an incredibly trendy new thing, but there's a lot of um, misinformation, I think, out there and a lot of um, ideas and views and opinions of what it is that may or may not be accurate. Um, a lot of people think that, you know, if you put in a xeric bed, that it's just going to be rocks and dirt and dust and gravel or that it's just going to be cactus or it's just never going to bloom because flowers don't bloom when there's no water and there's all these different opinions that um, may or may not be completely true and so we want to help to educate and spread this information that a drought adapted landscape can be truly gorgeous and stunning if you do it right and if you pick the right plants even in our desert region of Spokane, because we are technically truly a desert, are we not? High desert, yes. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, we don't think that way because we have our ponderosa forests and it's all green, but we, what, what do we get? 14 inches of rain in a year and most of it's in the winter? I think. Yeah, it, that's right. You know, it's not a lot. It's not a lot. <laughs> um, and so, uh, what this slideshow is about is how to use natives in the landscape. Is that right? Yes, yes. And uh, one of the things 
that I really enjoy about using native plants in the landscape is that it gives you a sense of place. Mm. Unlike, unlike the standard box store landscapes that are so common where you can't tell what city you're in because the landscapes are all identical. Yeah. 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 And everybody bought the same plants at Home Depot. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, I love it. And so um, if, if I understand right, the way this slideshow is broken up, uh, so our viewers know what to expect here, is first you're going to show us natives in like native landscape, how things really are in the where they really come from. And then you're going to show those plants in a house landscape and a home landscape used in a way that's truly beautiful. And then you're going to show us each plant individually. Is that right? That's right. And of course, there are probably about 10,000 native plants in Washington state alone. So this is just skimming the surface. Oh my goodness. I'm going to link her website down in the description below. So if you want to check out uh, her nursery or her website or make an appointment, by all means, click that link and check that out. Um, anything else before we jump into your slideshow? I can't think of anything right now. <laughs> That's it. Okay, cool. I'm really excited to hear about this. So uh, go ahead and start your screen sharing and show us what you've put together. Okay. <clears throat> okay, this is a presentation I've done a number of times for uh, garden clubs, uh, Strout Adapted Landscapes. Many of my customers have properties with ponderosa pines, and they're always asking me what to plant under them. The following slides show a, full a few examples from nature. Love it. Most of us who live here are familiar with the iconic spring scene in open pine woods, the annual bloom of arrowleaf balsam root. These wonderful wildflowers are tricky to grow since they have massive tap roots from the time they are seedlings. They're impossible to transplant from the wild because of this and need to be added to the landscape as small seedlings. Creeping Oregon grape is one of several shrub species common in the pines. Can you see my arrow? I can, yes. It's a nice little mound around the tree. Yes. They provide a foot tall ground cover with fragrant flowers and tart but edible fruit. Blue bunch wheatgrass is one of two major Western bunch grass species that are common under pines and in the open. The other major bunch grass in our area is Idaho fescue, which is a much smaller grass. Service berry. Our first white blooming native shrub is common in the pines. The fruit is edible and a real favorite with the birds. The Canadians have worked with this species to develop several improved varieties for the Yupik market. Snowberry is common under pines and can cover large areas because it spreads by rhizomes. This makes it a very useful plant to hold steep banks. Oh. And it's uh, it's quite widely adapted. You can see it out in the sagebrush steppe as well as in the forests and in the open. Does it tolerate sun as well as dappled shade? Oh yes. Okay. I just yes. It's it's got a wide what what we call a wide ecological amplitude. That is, it grows in a lot of different situations. Yeah. Um. Lots of different wildflowers bloom in open pine woods. I, I, you've got all my favorites right there, arrowleaf balsam root and lupin. And uh, Lewis's flax. Is that what that is? Cute. Yeah, each flower just stays open for the cooler part of the day and then closes up. Under denser pine canopies with lots of cover of fallen needles, you may find tufted phlox, which is blooming white here, desert lupin, prairie smoke, and cutleaf daisy. These can also grow in, in open areas, but uh, 
If you need something for partial shade, they're they're very nice ground covery thing. On a steep, gravelly, west-facing slope, here this is this is the Southfield Bluffs, yeah. which has really fine gravel as as the substrate. Mm -hmm. You uh, you can find blue bunch wheatgrass, lupins, and northern buckwheat. Kinnikinnick and tufted phlox form a mat on steep south-facing slope near Horseshoe Lake. Usually, Kinnikinnick is found in moister situations than this one. It's a forest plant and resents being too dry. I'm not sure why it likes this spot, but it sure is doing well. Yeah, it's beautiful. Here are some more xeric plants from the sagebrush steppe. Grassy areas in the sagebrush steppe feature many species of wildflowers. Among them are lupins and several species of wild buckwheat. Here at Fish Trap, we see blue bunch wheatgrass, snow buckwheat, this little low, almost white plant, northern buckwheat, and lupin and many wildflower species. In the spring, choke cherry blooms beautifully on north slopes and other moister microsites in the sagebrush steppe. There, it is a large shrub. Near rivers and other wetter areas, it can become a small tree. In the late summer, rabbit brush blooms yellow and choke cherries ripen. Arrowleaf balsam root grows in many habitats in our area. Sagebrush steppe, open grasslands, and forested areas. This lovely pink phlox is almost impossible to find once it goes to seed among the grasses. I'd love to be able to collect seed and grow it, but it's a tough one. Even the dry rocky areas have wildflowers. This area of scab rock by Cache Crater near Odessa has a beautiful patch of thyme leaf buckwheat blooming, along with bitterroot and rigid sage. Thyme leaf buckwheat was once famous in the bonsai trade as Ming tree. It's very slow growing and a little tricky to cultivate. Here at Twin Lakes, the rocky areas feature desert yellow daisy, blue bunch wheatgrass, snow buckwheat, and larkspur. This next section shows xeric plants and home landscapes. So what you're doing is you're going to take what we just saw and show us how to use it in a garden. Right. Ah, love it. This is what many folks think of when they think about drought adapted gardening. Cactus. <laughs> Prickly pears are hardy here. Yep. I have a couple. But there are many other plants that can handle cactus style drought. Big sagebrush, purple sage, slender buckwheat and sedum among a host of others. I really love purple sage. It's blooming here. Mm -hmm. When in bloom, it makes my head turn and it has a distinctive strong fresh fragrance and traditional medicinal uses. Along with big sagebrush, shrubby penstemon, this one with the purple flowers, Beautiful. slender buckwheat, sempervivums, and sedums, um, creeping thyme thrives in dry soils. Here, the shrubby penstemon is blooming purple and the sempervivums, also known as hens and chicks, have red tints. A little later in the season, other plants come into bloom. The same bed in June features white flowered northern buckwheat and hot rock penstemon, red flowered scarlet gilia, purple sage, and pink flowered desert penstemon. Mock orange is the white 
blooming shrub in the background and uh, yellow Oregon sunshine is also in the background here. Gorgeous. And this is at your nursery, right? I see your gate behind That's it. That's right. <laughs> oh, love it. That's right. That's the, the Rocky Mound at the entry. That was uh, when the new sewer system came through, they asked us if we wanted them to bury the rocks and gravel that they pulled up. But we said, no, we'll, we'll handle it. We'll use that. <laughs> that looks great. Right. And I don't see very many, if any at all, weeds in that. Is that just because the natives are so thick and nothing else really gets going? Um, for the most part, the only one that I have trouble with still everywhere is the bindweed. Mm, yeah, you can't do much about that one. It's evil. <laughs> Early. <laughs> uh, here's a closer look at the, the scarlet gilia. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. I love it. Ooh, I love those colors. That pink, that little hint of pink just makes the whole thing explode. It's gorgeous. Yeah, that's the, uh, is that? I think that's the desert buckwheat, but I, I mean the desert penstemon, but I didn't realize I had it in this part. Um, let's see, we have Indian blanket flower, which is very common in the woods and in the shrub step. Um, orange globe mallow, I love. It's uh, it's a very tough plant. The first time I collected seeds of it was from the track of a two track road through the sagebrush. And uh, they're, they're cool because they, they flower twice a summer even if you don't deadhead them. Oh, nice. Yeah. And then this is silky lupin, mm -hmm. orange milkweed, which is a Midwestern plant. So that's different from tropical milkweed, right? That's one that's more native to here? Yeah, that one is native to the Great Plains. Okay. And uh, this is showy daisy. Mm -hmm. And there's several species of penstemon here. I think this one is, well, it could be one of several. There's several red flowered ones. That's gorgeous. Here we have orange globe mallow with lupin, prickly poppy, Indian rice grass, which I just love. It's it so has a, an airy look, like kind of like baby's breath. Yeah. But it is a very wild grass. It doesn't stay put where you plant it. It'll move around, which is kind of fun. Yeah, so when it comes with a disclaimer, don't, don't, yes. <laughs> don't plant this in a tidy garden because it's not gonna stay where it's supposed to. And the prickly poppy, I'm not sure I would plant again because it is worse than cactus. Mm. So far as prickles. Noted. All right. Here we have the Indian rice grass again with blanket flower. Tufted evening primrose down here at the bottom and uh, Wasatch penstemon, the deep purple. Beautiful. And the two together. Mm. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, that blue. This is um, Nettles Larkspur. It's an annual, and it seeds itself madly. So if you get it in your landscape, you're going to have it forever, and and you'll be weeding it out, but keeping it at the same time. Now, can you deadhead to prevent the seeds from getting where you don't want them? You could, but it's a really, it's a kind of a wiry little plant. Okay. It's still and there's the orange milkweed again and the prickly poppy and in the the light yellow in the background is um blue mountain buckwheat it's beautiful so this white flower is the prickly poppy yes it's beautiful but or boy not fun to work around yeah i mean i can see the leaves look a lot like a thistle yes and they're very sharp, needle sharp. So, so think scotch thistle with a pretty flower. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. Scotch thistle's pretty too. <laughs> it is, it's beautiful. I wouldn't want it in my garden, but it's beautiful. <laughs> um, 
here we have fern bush, subalpine buckwheat, purple sage, and cascades penstemon. These all thrive with very occasional watering. The cascades penstemon I did not plant here. It jumped over from a shaded, better watered spot. So I guess I liked it. Um, here's the fern bush, purple sage, and subalpine buckwheat again. That this buckwheat is uh, common in the mountains around us, um, including the the bald spot on Mount Spokane. Nice, the bald spot. <laughs> in midsummer. Uh, I love these plants. There are very few of our regional natives that bloom in the summer. So I'm picking up plants that are from the Midwest or the Southwest that do bloom in summer. Um, the Apache plume here, you just see the, the seed heads, has a little white single rose type flower on it. And it blooms and has these fluffy seed heads all summer long. Mojave sage blooms all summer. It's like a, also known as giant flowered purple sage. It's a kind of a large version of our purple sage from the Southwest. And it is fully hardy here. Um, I wouldn't take it past <clears throat> spoke can farther north from Spokane though, because it, I don't think it would be fully hardy in, in a tough winter. I've had it, I've had the second year branches die back to the ground in a bad winter, but it'll, it'll sprout again, but the flowers are on the second year wood. Oh, so it doesn't bloom the second year if the wood dies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What and about, then, um, what about if you, cover it or insulate it with a frost blanket or with pine needles or something? I haven't tried that. I've just put it in a spot that's a little bit more protected. Yeah, okay. It's, uh, I have it up against the south side of a building and, and so does my my friend that I did a south side garden design for. Okay. And this little darling, this is dwarf sundrops. It's from the Midwest. It's wonderful because it blooms all summer long and it's just cheery and nice and it'll it'll uh, spread gently, seed itself gently around. The pink is, um, it's a uh, dianthus from the Caucasus Mountains. It's, it's one of my uh, non-North American natives. Oh, okay but it's still very pretty and it's very drought tolerant. Very drought tolerant. Love it. Yeah, because most of the dianthus that we plant in our gardens have to be watered because mm -hmm. they're cool plants, but I would love to have a dianthus variety that didn't need extra water. That is fabulous. And yeah, that sage is just stunning. It um, is, I love it. And the hummingbirds love it too. Oh, I bet. And the butterflies and bees. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Here's a nice little combination, a cut leaf daisy. You can barely see here in the corner. Oh, okay. With um, Kamshatka sedum, creeping woolly thyme, and um, coyote mint or mountain monar monardella, hmm. which is a, that's a traditional tea plant of the tribes around here. Oh, nice. It smells like chocolate mint. Even better. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when planting your yard, you should consider the idea of a zoned landscape. Cluster plants with similar water needs. You place thirsty high care plants closer to your home where you can give them additional care and place drought adapted plants in areas where it's more difficult to irrigate. The idea of a zoned landscape isn't new. Nature does it all the time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Here we have uh, an area. This is the, the channel between the two lakes, Twin Lakes out in Lincoln County. 
Uh, low areas in the sagebrush step are occupied by plants that need, require more moisture. In this example, sagebrush is in the higher, drier ground. Camas is in the moist stream margin and reeds are in the creek channel. And there's also this little weed, it's teasel, teasel, that came in from Europe to uh, comb wool. <laughs> Uh, that's my old botany partner out there from when I was doing field work with BLM. We were out in, in July and August monitoring rare plant sites, our most uh, threatened rare plant happens to bloom at the hottest time of summer. Oh. Uh, we, we were out hiking over the basalt in the heat of the summer oh lord with long pants and long sleeves oh absolutely and hats yeah you get torn up otherwise oh my goodness oh yeah but uh this is rocky ford and here at rocky ford the uplands are dominated by sagebrush while the lowlands near the creek are dominated by riparian shrubs such as douglas hawthorn the white flowers are those of the Western white clematis vine. Now this one is has an incredibly wide amplitude. It'll grow near the creeks and cover up the shrubs. Or it, I've also seen it climbing up uh, a basalt wall. Nice. It's 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 tough and beautiful. And uh, if you need something to cover a large area, it'll go 20 feet. Ooh, yeah, cool. Here at Twin Lakes, sagebrush dominates the uplands and the canyon bottoms have enough moisture to support ponderosa pine. North slopes of rock formations in the sagebrush steppe support many plant species that need just a little more moisture than the sagebrush flats. These are called shrub garlands. Uh, often these are fruiting shrubs such as golden currant, serviceberry, chokecherry, and elderberry. Here, sagebrush is in between the shrub garland and a slightly moister swale that supports basin wild rye, which is very large, tall grass. So basically, all the moisture in this area is coming down into this swale, kind of like a valley, and so that's supporting plants that need a little more moisture than what we typically mm -hmm. get. And the rocks channel the channel the water for the shrubs as well. Awesome. Do you get more biodiversity in little microclimates like that? Absolutely. Yeah. So the concept of zoning in the residential landscape is shown in the next few slides. The mock orange hedge has a dedicated drip line for occasional watering. The yard near the house is regularly watered. The bed in the foreground and the center bed, these, where's my, are unwatered. So you get Most, all those flowers. I actually, I actually had to water this area last year because it was such a brutal year. Okay. But this area did not get any water last year. So all those flowers with no supplemental water in Spokane. Correct. That is amazing. <laughs> it's incredible. It really is. So um, here's another look farther in. This area is generally unwatered. At, at the most, most years, I might water it once or twice at the height of summer. And then this this part, this has been totally revamped the last year or so, but it's still a prairie bed, a Midwestern prairie bed that gets watered once or twice a month in the dry season. This is just incredible. But this goes to show right here that you can have a truly gorgeous landscape with no water. You can still be water wise. And because you, you, you've you used, from a design standpoint here, you've used different colors, different textures, and different bloom times, and you've made 
a truly stunning garden and don't need water. Right. That's amazing. It's, it's a test garden for all these species I'm playing with. <laughs> well, isn't that the point where gardeners with businesses, our whole yard is a test plot. <laughs> right. So that the same area from the, from the north side shows a drought garden in the center. This, yep. a lightly watered prairie garden to the left and the mock orange hedge in the background with the drip line. The roses and other flowers and shrubs to the right are regularly watered about once a week. But still only once a week. Unlike yeah. what a lot of people do where it's- I like, water the least I can get away with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, this, to the caption says it all. This is mixed. This is kind of the border between the dry and the moisture. So the uh, the western juniper and the yucca are in the dry side, and then it gets moisture watered over here. What's that orange? Right. What's the orange flower there? This is um, western columbine. I thought it was a columbine, but I, I've never I, seen that. Yeah, it's one of the prettiest, I think. There's a no, there's a slide there's a close up of it in my individual species slides. The kinikinik, I think the kinikinik probably gets a little water when I water the hedge since that is so close. Look how dense it is. That's just gorgeous. And here we have uh, the landscape at the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife headquarters. It was planned and installed by the Northeast chapter of the Washington Native Plant Society. It features many regional native plants and is a great place to visit to see what native plants can do in the landscape. This small section is a dry garden featuring purple sage and gray rabbit brush. Did you help design that bed? Yeah, and I provided a lot. I provided a lot of the plants for that project. That's awesome. Our regional forest shrubs make a fine understory in the front of a suburban lot. This is my neighbor's lot across the street, and I just love it. So he's got this kind of a screen of native plants in front of his front yard along the street. I bet the bees just go nuts with all that Oregon grape and the maple flowers. Oh, yes. Oh, oh now there we go. That's, that's my favorite right there. Mm. Okay. Most of the flowering plants of the arid west are spring blooming. Mm -hmm. Midwestern wildflowers are useful to get more color into a low water landscape. These can be maintained with irrigation once or twice a month in the dry season. So here we have um, Black Eyed Susan, Purple Coneflower, and Leatris. Mm -hmm. And I think I see a Baptista over on the side. Or what, what's that trifoliate? Actually, this is um, Three Leaf Sumac. Really? Which has, oh my gosh, the, the fall color on the Three Leaf Sumac is just amazing. It, it can be yellow, orange, red, purple, and sometimes all of those in succession or mixed. Yes, I love sumac's fall color. It's just incredible. And this one isn't invasive. Okay. The, the three leaf sumac. It's not invasive and the, the flowers, the flowers are really inconspicuous, but the bees love them. Oh, nice. It's just humming in the spring. And this one's also not a poisonous variety, I, I'm imagining. No. Okay, this is uh, Budalua, also known as blue grama grass. It has little eyelashes as its flowers. Aww. It's so cute. And this is Leatris. This is the most drought adapted species of Leatris in seed. And this is the Indian grass and the little blue stem and echinacea going to seed. 
I think I see some puffs that are the um, milkweed going to seed. Mm. So, native plants can provide some solutions to landscape problems. Tall shrubs such as mock orange and tall Oregon grape pictured here, service berry, edible viburnum, buffalo berry, big hazelnut, blue elderberry, and others can provide privacy and screening. Tufted phlox, heuchera, prairie smoke, and Idaho fescue tolerate considerable shade and can help hold the slope. These photos from the South Hill Bluff show steep dry slopes with blue bunch wheat grass, wild buckwheat, lupin, purple sage, and yarrow. This homeowner has planted drought adapted plants on the south side of his house where watering is very difficult. These plants require almost no water or maintenance. We have um, Barrett's penstemon, which is, it's a rare plant in nature. It grows only, it's a regional endemic. That, that means it grows only in the area around the Columbia River Gorge in Idaho, and, not Idaho, in Oregon and Washington. This is tufted evening primrose, the cushion phlox. Uh, this one's going to bloom later. That's a penstemon. This is the uh, alpine buckwheat. This is rock penstemon. Blue Mountain Penstemon and Oregon Sunshine. Did you already say what the blue one in the back is? Or is that also Barrett's? That's also Barrett's. It's got a lot of Barrett's in there. I figured, um, my thought was that uh, you don't want a lot of water by your foundation. Yeah. Yeah. What so, a concept, um, right? If you plant things that are low and it's low and evergreen and it spreads up to four feet wide so evergreen evergreen yes so it's a good one for a, a foundation planting where you don't want too much water against your house and it's also not tall enough to obstruct windows or um interfere with things i have to make a note because I just realized that's the solution to one of my clients' problems. This homeowner has planted ocean spray, knick-knick, creeping Oregon grape, and creeping thyme in her shady spots. Here we have the, the knick-knick, and there's an ocean spray back here. It's a little hard to see in the sun. But here's a better picture of it. She has it in with her... Um, Oh, come on. Rhododendrons? Oh, yeah. And here's the Oregon grape and creeping thyme. This South Hill homeowner has planted his unwatered parking strip and a wide variety of Western dryland natives. Uh, more than I can <laughs> narrate right here. So, this is. Um, um, mountain mahogany, curl leaf mountain mahogany. And that one will get pretty large in time. Is that something that'll obstruct the sidewalk, do you think, or will it be prunable? It'll be prunable, but it's a little large for this situation. <laughs> More options for street side plantings include. Barrett's penstemon again. Love Purple it. Purple sage, northern buckwheat, and Oregon sunshine. This planting gets snow plowed onto it every winter and it still thrives. Excellent. I think it also gets, probably gets the road chemicals too. I was going to say, that means road salts and everything else. Right. Ooh. 
So here's here's the rogue gallery. <laughs> Some of my favorite drought tolerant landscape plants. And what's the favorite? Whatever's blooming now, right? Yeah, exactly. That <laughs> right there. <laughs> <laughs> This is shrubby penstemon. This is a regional native. It grows in the mountains and um, you can see a fabulous patch of it if you go over the pass between North Spokane and Newport. It's in the rocks on the pass. If you're lucky enough to catch it at the right time, there's a huge catch there. It's beautiful. It blooms. It's a very short period of bloom, but it's like a fountain of flowers when it's in bloom and it's evergreen. And it's a good ground cover, spreads, um, spreads up to four feet wide and it's a foot or less tall. This is a, a white version of that same species. Purple sage and scarlet gilia just love those two mm, and together both of them are things that turn my head if i see them when i'm driving <laughs> right well i mean and and together they play off each other because the blue and the orange are complementary colors which immediately makes them just explode visually oh yeah Put them next to That's, each other and it's just even better the scarlet gilia is a biennial it makes a little um rosette the first year kind of looks like snowflakes and then the second year it blooms and and uh, seeds and dies, but you can naturalize it by planting um, either planting a first year plant and a second year plant at the same time or planting seedlings two years in a row. Yeah. The hummingbirds love it. Oh, look at that beautiful flower. And this one. Um, most of the times I've seen it have been out in the sagebrush. Hmm. But um, kind of on the edge of a pine patch in the sagebrush. Arrowleaf balsam root, of course. Yes. What's not to love? That is one of my favorites in spring. It's just like spring is officially here and it's glorious. <laughs> yes. And every part of the plant is edible at some point. It was widely used by Native Americans and it's widely used by all kinds of animals. You know, catching the seeds is uh, can be tricky. Yeah. Not only do a lot of critters eat the seeds, but also it there are some insects that'll ruin the seeds. Mm -hmm. So if you come upon a, a seed head that's kind of that's not beautifully round and, and symmetrical. It's kind of twisted looking that that seed head is is not viable because the bugs have gotten in it. And isn't it particularly difficult to germinate? Um, wait a minute. It's it's a little tricky. It's one of the things you absolutely have to get planted early in the fall. Yeah. Oh, and how long does it take to go from seed to bloom? Uh, three to five years. Yeah, that's a long-term commitment, folks. <laughs> right, right. It's worth it, it's worth it but it's, it's a long-term. And, and another trick with a plant like that that I would use, um, because it blooms and then it seeds, but the foliage dies and it just looks like a dead thing for the rest of the summer. So it's gorgeous throughout May. Um, is it May that it's blooming? I should actually ask you. I think so, because it's always blooming so. up on Bloomsday. I think so, because I collect seeds in June. <laughs> oh, good idea. <laughs> good tip. Um, I always wait till fall. Maybe that's why I've always gone wrong. <laughs> so, but by June and July, it's a dead thing. And uh, so in a landscape, what I do with that kind of a plant is I plant it towards the back behind something that's lower in the spring, but then grows up. So what you do is you have your, your spring bloomer, arrowleaf balsam root in this case, that's blooming and looking pretty while the thing in front of it is short and not doing much. And then as the arrowleaf balsam root dies back, the short thing is now growing up and it covers up the dead thing. So yep, that's, that's a good way to do it. Um, I also have mine in a 
in a patch of Connecticut. Perfect. It just goes away. You don't even think. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, this is northern buckwheat. Um, it is the plant to plant if you have a hot, dry spot that you can't get anything else to grow on. It is so tough. The only drawback is that it um, it dies back in winter, so it's not pretty in winter. Wild buckwheats are butterfly hosts. I've been told by an entomologist that there are particular butterflies that that um, are hosted by particular buckwheats. Oh, wow. And wild buckwheats are very important dryland species for pollinators. They bloom in the driest areas and there are about 350 different species and varieties throughout the West. Some of them are, well, they're all wonderful. <laughs> <I think. laughs> We have about a dozen in the Columbia Basin species of, of wild buckwheats. Different species. We need to go on a nature walk, Diane. <laughs> oh, I love that. Do that. <laughs> yes. Skippers like them too. I love skippers. <laughs> They're so cute. Cute. And this one's uh this this buckwheat is um a variety of sulfur buckwheat that only grows um, in the northwest corner of the basin near Peshastan. And I have only gotten seed for it once. I'm gonna try, and it crosses with my subalpine buckwheat. So, um, because they're the same species, but a different variety. So I, I need to try cutting propagation this year because this is a marvelous, plant evergreen and and the beautiful yellow flowers pretty i love that butterfly is that a painted lady or do you know i don't know <laughs> entomology is not our thing we do plants <laughs> right this oregon sunshine or woolly daisy uh this is a butterfly magnet i don't have the photo in here that I got down in uh, Horse Seven Hills that was absolutely covered with, with checker spots. But um, it can't decide whether it's an annual, biennial, or a perennial. It, I have had plants that have done all of those things. Uh, it does seed itself. It's just a lovely little cheery thing. I love it. How long does that bloom for? Ooh. Um, maybe a month. And then if you have seeded in plants, you can have um, have it blooming longer up. Uh, yeah. Okay. Asking me how long something blooms <laughs> is really a hard question. That's what I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. <laughs> Creeping woolly thyme, it's, it's not native, but it's a wonderful ground cover for uh, all the creeping thymes are great grass substitutes. I've seen drought, some, drought adapted. Yeah, I've seen some amazing pictures of people that just have woolly thyme as their whole lawn. And it's oh, yeah. want to roll on it. <laughs> well, my dog thinks it's the best dog bed ever. It's pretty cushy. It's like a carpet. Yeah. Much denser than the other creeping times. Nice. And it hardly blooms. This is cut leaf penstemon. It is the exception to the rule that our regional native plants don't flower in summer. It's a summer bloomer. You'll see it often on cliffs. I thought it was pretty uncommon until I boated in Fish Trap Lake and it was growing on the cliffs there. Nice. I've also seen it other places on cliffs but it's um it blooms for a long time and it'll seed itself in and the seedlings may have different colors i've had seedlings of this either pink or baby blue or purple but most commonly in the wild you'll find it this hot pink color 
Just a stunning, beautiful color. Ooh, yes. This is a great combination. The Larkspur and the orange milkweed. Mm. The Larkspur is regional. The orange milkweed is a, a Midwestern native. Fern bush again. You gotta and get close in up. Bloom. Uh, 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 the fern bush, the the distant picture doesn't do it justice. You've got to get the close up of those gorgeous leaves. There and it is, flowers and leaves. <laughs> this is um the first time I met this plant was at Craters of the Moon, growing out of the cracks of the lava. Nice. And I've had a, an herbalist approach me. Apparently, the, the roots are useful as an alternative, like ginseng. But um, I don't think we, we're kind of at the northern extent of its ability to grow, I think. Okay. Um, it's much more common in the southwest, but anywhere from, you know, southeast. Idaho southwards. Hmm. And there it's another one of those tough plants in the rose family. Oh yeah. This is spiny fame flower. If you recall the the slide from Odessa craters, that's another that's the kind of habitat it grows in naturally. It grows on the scab rock and blooms in summer when it's really, really hot. When it gets too dry, the whole plant turns red, but I, it won't uh, die. <laughs> when I was in Ontario, just after I graduated college, I took a job in Ontario and working in a greenhouse. Um, and he grew this, my boss did. And he said that there were only two or three places in all of North America that could, se could successfully grow telenum. And that we were one of them. And it was, uh, I mean, I just propagated it like crazy because I thought it was such a pretty, pretty, pretty thing. I feel like I did it from cuttings or I divided it or something. I don't even remember how I did it now, but. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. yeah, I've always done it from seed. They're beautiful. <laughs> it's just so wispy and, and dainty and. Airy, it's lovely. Yeah. The flowers seem to just float above the plant. They do. It's just gorgeous. But boy, is it a tough one. Yeah, it's hard to grow, huh? Oh, no, tough as in well adapted to harsh conditions. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, good. Even better. <laughs> this is uh, yucca filamentosa. This, uh, it can get six, seven feet tall when it's in bloom. I love it as a, uh, as a green accent in the winter and when it flowers and uh, I, I like the way the it's in the lily family and I think so is asparagus. I love the way the buds look like asparagus. Yeah, that's neat. Uh, it's one of those things, uh, be sure you know where you want it because you can't move it. I always tell my clients, once this is planted, you are married to it and you cannot get a divorce. It won't work. <laughs> but I, I just love it. I think it's wonderful. I love yuccas. There's the orange globe mallow again. Beautiful. Desert lupin. This is a little lupin that I've only found in one place um, in the county. That's not saying that I've been everywhere in the county. It's probably a lot of other places, but I found this on Donkey Island in the in the Spokane River near me. It's uh, I th the botanists tell me it's a biennial. I've had it bloom the first year, and I've had it bloom more than one year, but it does seem to disappear after a couple of years. But it'll seed itself, so it'll pop up somewhere else. It's just the prettiest little lupin. It's less than a foot tall. I could understand it being a biennial, though. I mean, I don't know if I'm looking at desert lupin when I go on my hikes, but I always see little rosettes, and then I see the ones blooming. Mm -hmm. Little babies. And I never really thought anything of it, because native plants have never been my area of expertise, you know. But um, yeah, I could see biennial. That makes sense. <clears throat> Here's the western columbine. 
That is gorgeous. Right next to it, yeah. so you've got orange and you've got purple. Yeah, that. So I can't collect this seed because it's probably, <laughs> probably mixed. Columbines are really promiscuous. Oh, that's okay. It's a surprise. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> but this one is, it's so dainty. It has um, the red with the, what are those called? The little center stamen pistol bits? Well, it's, there it's yellow. The inner inner petals are yellow and the outer ones with the projections are red. Yeah. Oh, gorgeous. It's a slightly different shape than your typical columbine as well. Yeah, it is. And, and this is the coyote mint, the mountain monardella. Okay. Now, does this the, spread like other mints or is this well behaved? No, it's, it's a little, it's a little clump. Nice. It's a little rounded plant. And I found it, uh, I have, this is in my dry bed. I found it does better and lasts longer if you have a little bit of shade and a little bit of water. But if you want to see it in the wild, you can go down to um, Sun Lakes and you'll see it in the um, in the rock for not rock formations, the big bouldery areas with the big round cobbles by the side of the road. But it is a traditional tea plant. Okay. Tufted evening primrose. So beautiful. They um they do open in the late afternoon. And on a cold cool day, they'll stay open all day. On a hot day, they'll be closed up by noon. Okay. Now, does it open at night as well, or just because it says? Yeah, it's open through the night. Through the night, so that's that'd be a great like moonflower type of a in a moon garden. Yeah, it really would. Mm -hmm. It really would. Um, mine don't get this big very often, but the one in my friend's garden got really big, and I think because he watered it a couple times in the summer. Nice. A little goes a long way with these plants, huh? Yes, it does. <clears throat> this is the Missouri Evening Primrose, the most wonderful crayon yellow flowers. They're huge and it blooms for a very long time and you can trick it into blooming longer by picking the pods off. Nice, just a little deadheading extends its season a bit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it makes about a three foot, it's it's about as big as a bushel basket. The the um the plant the spread of the it, plant. How much it creeps out? The spread of the plant. It, it will seed itself, and that's great if you want it to. And if you don't want it to, you can pull the pods. Pinch, pinch. Absolutely. It's um it's a midwesterner, but it has a massive taproot, so it's very drought adapted. Nice. Plains prickly pear. Love it. This is the Wasatch penstemon. Sticky stem penstemon. This is from southeast Washington around uh, around the Snake River, the slightly moist meadows near the Snake River. What makes the stem sticky? Uh, it's covered with tiny glands on Stems. If you can see, it's kind of got a white glow along the side of the stem. Yeah, it looks kind of fuzzy. And if it's backlit, you can really see them. It's really fascinating. <laughs> it grows about two to three feet tall, and it's a very large, large flowered for a penstemon. Nice. Very pretty. Mm, look at that. Can you see? You can kind of see a white haze along the edge of the stem, and that's the yeah the light catching the glands. So it's a little bit different from like a hair. It's not um, 
Yeah, it's not a hair. It's like a little, looks like a, if you under magnification, it looks like a little lollipop. <laughs> I'm going to have to do that. <laughs> Next summer, I'm doing it. Get out my magnifying glass or my microscope. Magnifying glasses and microscopes are wonderful. They're so much fun. It's amazing what the world looks like. Yeah. <clears throat> this is pine leaf penstemon. It's pretty common in the nursery trade. Um, I haven't ever tested it totally dry. Um, I do have a customer who has put it in a much drier site than I have it in, and it seemed to work. It's very long lived. That's a nice thing about it. Yeah. Um, Penstemon venustus, sometimes called beautiful penstemon. I, I was calling it Blue Mountain Penstemon, but there's another one. Common names are tough. Yeah, yeah. There's, a common name can encompass so many plants and it can change by region. Yeah, and this one, it's really easy. It's one of the easiest penstemons to grow and one that looks like, doesn't look like a wild plant. No, looks like something you'd buy at a regular nursery to put in your garden. Yeah, it's semi shrubby. It has a woody base and um, herbaceous stems that come up. So uh, if you're, I, I usually prune the dead stems in the spring and look out for the buds. Mm. Okay. And then showy daisy in the foreground. And uh, You've got uh, I think that's autumn joy sedum in the foreground as well. I think I see a common milkweed in the middle too. Is that right? Kind of between the penstemon and the daisy? I know. Well, yeah, you're right. You're right. That's showy yeah. milkweed. Oh, okay. Good eye. Yeah, I was looking at that. I'm suddenly so passionate about milkweed because I want to help the butterflies. And so I'm like, okay, I need all the milkweeds, but not the ones that spread. <laughs> so you don't want that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Orange milkweed is safe. <laughs> This is uh, tufted phlox. It is very common in the pine woods where you find um, where you find balsam root and lupins. This is a common ground cover under the pines, and it has some variation in color. Mm -hmm. And here it is in a garden. So pretty. Prairie smoke, love oh. prairie smoke. Yes. Triflorum. It makes a nice ground cover. It um, it's very drought tolerant, but it one of its things. If it gets too dry, it'll go dormant. Mm. But if it gets a little water, it'll stay green all season. And once the flowers are done, it has uh, the fluffy seed heads that are the the smoke. Yeah, and that's also known as old man's whiskers. Aw, cute. And how long do the seed heads persist on there? They last several months, don't they? Oh, yes. They last months. So it's it's ornamental in flower and in seed. So pretty. And then it's just, just green the rest of the year. And does it tolerate um, some shade, if I remember right? Oh, yeah. This is a good one for um, anywhere from full sun to pretty not full shade but partial shade for sure nice. pretty heavy shade good stuff this is wax current growing out that of the one. rock <laughs> yeah growing out of the rock because <laughs> our natives got to be tough <laughs> yeah i love this one it grows out in the sagebrush step right next to the sagebrush and it's like christmas in july with the green leaves and the orange berries, scarlet berries. So pretty. This is golden currant. Golden currant gets to be quite large. It's, two, let's see, six or seven feet tall and about six feet wide. It likes um, wetland margins. It likes um, like the edges of uh, an aspen grove. 
but I've also seen it growing. It also grows uh, in those shrub garlands at on the north slopes of the rock formations in the sagebrush. The berries are edible, they're delicious. To yeah. me, they taste like tangerine. If you can get them before the birds do, the birds love them. I will, yeah. They, they have <laughs> yellow flowers in spring that are slightly fragrant. And, and it's a very, it's an early bloomer. Um, not quite as early as wax current. I think wax current blooms first. This is birch leaf spirea, common in the forests around us. I, I enjoy this in my garden because it attracts very unusual pollinators. It attracts a lot of little beetles, different little beetles. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah. I always love how spirea looks so fluffy and soft. Yeah, that's because of all the stamens sticking out. Yeah, it goes out a bit. And now does birch leaf only come in the white color? Um, yes, but it, I have had some pink ones. It can cross with um, the spirea, Douglas spirea, which grows in swamps. They call it, the botanists call it hard hack because it's hard to move through. <laughs> <laughs> but that one has a pyramidal cluster of pink flowers nice. and sometimes they cross and you'll get a pink um, birch leaf this is a smaller plant this is um less than three feet oh. and the, the um hard hack the the douglas spirea get four four and a half feet tall yeah that's good to know for maintenance wise, because if you can avoid pruning a spirea, you should, but sometimes, sometimes it's got to be done. Mm -hmm. I only deadhead them. Yeah. Oh, I don't even do that. I'll, occasionally I'll hedge them, but those are like magic carpets and the things that we buy in regular nurseries. Um, mm -hmm. Hedge them and give them some more bloom. They'll bloom again which is nice. I don't know if that's what the natives do, but that's what the... Uh, I don't know. I've never tried to get them to bloom a second time. Yeah. So I don't know. <clears throat> this is service berry with unripe fruit. Mm. Service berry is um, common in the forest and uh, in those shrub garlands in, this, in the sagebrush and moist swales in the sagebrush. And um, the fruit is edible. It's much used by uh, tribal people. And I, I asked uh, I asked a Native American guy who visited the nursery once about it because uh, botanists recognize about four different varieties of the species. And I said that to him and he said, well, we just recognize two varieties, the ones we use and the ones we tell you about. <laughs> Nice. But the Canadians have developed you pick varieties of these that are not as seedy. They are, these are pretty tasty, but they do vary quite a bit. Yeah. Mock orange. This oh. is Idaho state flower. Beautiful. And uh, you see it a lot in the woods and near the river and uh, uh, in those shrub garlands in the in the sagebrush step, there's one spot um, out east of east of west of Davenport where um, there are rock formations and it's they're just quite <laughs> when these are in bloom. Mm. It's so beautiful. Uh, don't, do they do they smell as heavenly as I remember? Yes, yeah. yes, they smell wonderful. Oh, one thing I forgot to say about, about service berry, it's our first white flowering native shrub, the first one to bloom in the spring. Yeah, I think you said that way back at the beginning, but that's good to then, reinforce now. And then uh, this one's a June bloomer, and it, gener it blooms at the same time as that Venus penstemon. Oh. They're really nice together. Yeah. Uh, Midwestern prairie species, the black-eyed Susan, coneflower, and liatris. 
Monarda fistulosa, also known as, it has a lot of common names, which means it's a popular plant. Yeah. Sometimes called bee balm, sometimes called wild bergamot, wild oregano, and um, it's a traditional tea plant. And I, I was given this plant when I was very a very young homesteader, and it was given to me as oregano. So I used it as oregano for many years before I learned botany and found out it wasn't. Oh. <laughs> flavor. I like it better than regular oregano and in, in pizzas and spaghetti sauce and that kind of stuff. That's cool. <laughs> Hummingbirds and bees love it. Yes. And it can get it can get quite tall. Um, one question about monardas. The varieties that we get at nurseries tend to be um, I mean like regular conventional nurseries tend to be really prone to powdery mildew. Is that an issue with this one? Yes, this one does get powdery mildew. Okay, so keep it in the sun, basically, and don't get water on the leaves. Uh-huh. Yep, all right. There's the azure sage. This is a Midwesterner that I just, oh, I love the color. It blooms with the asters, uh -huh. so it's a really late summer bloomer. And depending on where you plant it and how much water it gets, it can be anywhere from three feet to seven feet. <laughs> this is this is by the fence. My neighbor waters their lawn, and so uh, and and the the water extends a couple feet onto my property, so I take advantage. <laughs> <laughs> Just gotta borrow your water that you're throwing over here. You know? Yeah, you bet. <laughs> things that you'll like there. I think that's part of the reason I never had to water my xeric bed is because my neighbor's sprinkler, for whatever reason, it wasn't spraying her lawn. It kept coming all the way over into my driveway. And so my xeric bed was getting watered every morning <laughs> along with her lawn. Oh my. <laughs> right up until that heat wave. So I never had to water it. <laughs> The bees love it. The hummingbirds like it. Usually the hummingbirds are gone by the time it blooms though. Yeah. But it's just that wonderful sky blue that you can't get in very many plants. Mm -mm. Blue is such a rare color in plants. This is a little blue stem. It's a Midwestern grass from the mixed grass prairie. And uh, I just love the way it blows in the wind. It's very flexible. Uh -huh. Switchgrass. It's really hard to take a good picture of switchgrass. It has these round um, um, seeds that the the flowers are often red and the round seeds are just really interesting very airy it looks almost like japanese bloodgrass with uh with a bloom on top yeah it is um a lot of the midwestern native grasses turn beautiful colors in the fall very pretty oh that it's seems to it. oh my goodness that was wonderful. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm just like blown away at how, how many natives can make such, such beautiful landscapes and just how to do it. One of the reasons I'm so excited about this conversation with you is because I want to learn more techniques about how to use these plants for my clients. Mm -hmm. And I also, you know, why I wanted to record it is because I want to spread this information and start to deal with the um, mindset out there that native and xeric and pollinator and all these different new trendy gardens are ugly or messy or dead or they never bloom or they're just rocks or all, you know, they, there's all these opinions about them and they're just, it doesn't have to be that way. And uh, right. so this is really very, very educational. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad that you, uh, I'm happy that it's going to go out to a wider audience because, you know, I've done this 
presentation at garden clubs numerous times and I might get one or two people that that come to the nursery out of out of each presentation right it probably takes at least an hour to give this uh, presentation and mm -hmm. doing it over and over and over and over again this way we'll reach a huge wide audience and you only had to say it once <laughs> Maybe we can update the update later because I have, um, <clears throat> like I said, I completely revamped the prayer deck last year. Nice. So that should be coming into its own this year. So I'll have a whole new section on the, the American Prairie awesome. plant. Well, of course, this is just scratch, barely scratching the surface of the native plants that are out there. There's oh, yeah. like 10,000 native plants in Washington alone. I see all the way, like you drive down our freeway and all you'd think is grass and sagebrush. That's our natives and that's, oh, and ponderosas. And that's it, mm -hmm. you know, but there's so many and they're so pretty if they're used correctly. <laughs> Yeah, I'd absolutely love to update this. I'd love to take some follow up pictures of um, some of the landscapes you helped me plant. Like, you know. Mm -hmm. you oh, absolutely. I need a. I need to create a portfolio. Yeah. That well, let's do it. We'll make a video portfolio. <laughs> the one from my friend, uh, the south side of his house. That was. Um, he's a disabled guy. You can't. He's had a zillion back surgery. Well, four back surgeries and his spine is almost totally fused. So bending over is not a thing for him. Yeah. And um, he asked me to create a zero maintenance, zero water bed for the south side of his house. <laughs> well, like as close as I could. Yeah. And I've learned a lot from it. There's certain plants that I would not plant there again and certain plants that I would, but the the Barrett's Penstemon, the Mojave Sage, and the, the Phlox, and, and the, oh, the Tufted Evening Primrose, those have just been fabulous. And there's a, the Penstemon that wasn't in bloom yet was Tori's Penstemon, and that thing gets five feet tall in bloom. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, that's so, amazing. I have I have lifetime permission to collect seed there. <laughs> oh, good, good. And you know, even better when you get the chance to follow up with clients where you've put in a garden. That's one of the things I love about the way we do business because we maintain what we plant, so we get to see how it grows and how it matures over time. And if there's something that maybe didn't work, we won't do that again. Unlike exactly. You know, unlike regular landscapers that plant a tree three feet from the foundation and wonder why it's up in the eaves five years later. Gee. Oh God. Yeah. I don't I don't have any shrubs close to my house. Oh, because you're smart enough to know better. <laughs> I just I every time I can't even count the number of times I've come up on that, doing a consultation for a new client and I see a tree rubbing the house top in the eaves and they don't know what to do with the tree how do we prune it we well, don't prune it it shouldn't have been planted here in the first place you know thank the landscaper that can you tell i get a little bit irritated about this sorry let's come back to well, Nate. yeah it's understandable <laughs> yeah that's one of my peeves too <laughs> <laughs> just, they're like fly by night landscapers that really they just they make it pretty so the house can sell and they don't care what happens five years down the road because they got paid. That's it. That's all they do. Right. And um, and most of them never go back and look at what they did. I actually talked mm -hmm. to one about that one time and he said, well, we're not worried about, you know, what it's going to happen later because the new owner is going to change it. But no, they're not. Homeowners don't know that they need to change or maintain their landscape. They think it's going to look exactly how it was when they bought the house forever oh. they don't they don't they're homeowners you know most homeowners aren't gardeners they don't understand how that tree is going to grow they know it will grow but they don't know how and anyway again yeah, <laughs> yeah one slide to show that that followed my uh drought garden from planting year to five years in i think yeah, but it changes every year. It's never the same. Oh, so cool. 
Yeah, oh, my goodness. Okay, well, we could talk all day. Um, <laughs> at some point, Zoom is going to kick us off, I think. <laughs> okay, well, this has been really fun, Amy. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, you're so welcome. And folks, again, if you want to get in touch with Diane, make sure to check out her website with the link down below. If you want help with designs, we can both, we work together and collaborate on designs now. Um, she'll do the drawing and I'll do the planting and it is great. So um, make sure to follow up and check that out if you're interested. And uh, any questions, please leave a comment below. If I don't know the answer, Diane will. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> and if you haven't already remember to subscribe so you see future content like this thanks so much guys i'll see you in the garden